Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. So you have one of the hottest, fastest growing businesses in the world, and somebody comes along and offers to buy it from you for $50 million. But if you keep going, the business could be worth three times that within a year or two. So what do you do? Well, that's the decision Gerard Adams had to face last year at the age of 30. Now to cut to the chase, he said yes, and they accepted the check. But what's really important and what you need to hear today is how they got to that point and what he's decided to do since. So how do you build such a high growth company? How do you get some of the most successful people in the world on your advisory board? How should you compensate them? And what in the world do you do next? Well, the wisdom in this episode could have literally saved me millions of dollars if I had had access to it just 12 months ago. So please get ready to enjoy one of the most interesting and insightful guests that we've ever had on the show. This is Gerard Adams. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Mike Dillard here. And today we're going to be talking to Mr. Gerard Adams, who's coming to us from New York City. And uh, as you heard just a couple of seconds ago, Gerard has an absolutely amazing history as an entrepreneur, an unbelievable story. And we've got quite a few mutual friends in common as well. So Gerard, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike. Nice to... uh... Nice to finally get on the podcast and meet you, and thanks for having me. Yeah, I am. I am super stoked about uh, about our our interview today, and I've got a ton of questions lined up for you in your history, which I find uh, absolutely fascinating. And I think there's probably a few people in in our audience uh, who might not be familiar with that story, and so I was wondering if you would take us back to the very beginning as we dive in here today. You know, really to your starting point as an entrepreneur when you decided to become one and what that first business was that you started? You know, it's interesting. I feel like entrepreneurship was, uh, is, uh, was just like in my blood. Um, didn't even realize it because, you know, like I remember back in, uh, recently I got interviewed and they asked me like, what was like the first thing, first business? How'd you make your like first thousand dollars? And I remember it was actually like in middle school when I was hustling Mark Echo t-shirts at right before, like he really got popular and I had them on, I got them on like wholesale and and I was always doing like little businesses like this throughout growing up. Everything from that to like going and shoveling the whole neighborhood, you know, um, to then car parts as I got older to more and more things. But then I feel like I really stepped into becoming an entrepreneur when I dropped out of my first dropped out of college my first semester, and I felt school really wasn't for me. I really felt like the the college education system was uh, was a big business. They were telling me what classes to take, how to take them. And even though I wanted to make my parents proud, um, I just felt it wasn't for me, that learning process. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to drop out and follow my passion and to uh, self-educate myself around the stock market. I was really interested in the invest, you know, investing into the market and why the how companies became successful. I looked at the market like, man, there's, you know, if Apple's on there and, you know, all these big companies – you know, I really want to understand the landscape of what made these companies successful. Um, and I was, you know, dropped out. Um, and uh, back then, it was tough because there was, you know, the word, I didn't consider myself an entrepreneur yet. Like, I didn't even really say I was becoming an entrepreneur. I really just wanted to learn about business. Um, and my first business was building. So I wanted to learn about the stock market. So I decided, why don't I solve my own problem? Because there must be other people out there that want to learn. And I looked at the online community uh, landscape of like different forums and chat rooms for stocks and none of them had any form of credibility. So I was like, what if I took the rating system from eBay and like Amazon and I integrated it into building my own stock forum where each member had one to five stars color coordinated based upon how much, how many times you were ranked. And then you can see who really is a really good stock picker and why, um, and click on their profile and see, and see what they're all and what they're, what they're talking about. So um, and then that would allow me to find mentors or gurus that like were really great traders and investors. So I created, it was called stock spot, um, went all in, found somebody who knew how to code, kind of like designed it. it was just like so passionate it was just staying up till freaking three, four in the morning, every night, like building it, work my butt off, figuring out different unique ways using digital, you know, digital media to like market it, getting like 10,000 initial members. And that kind of led me to my first failure, I would say. Where basically uh, I ended up getting a, a phone call 
football from a local CEO. I grew up in New Jersey and a, and a local CEO that had a, a small cap company that was public called M Phase. He called me up and he said, hey, how can I advertise with your website? And I was like, wow, okay, now I can monetize this. And I was super excited. And he was like, how old are you? And I was like, well, I'm you know, 17, 18 years old at that time. So he's like, geez, you know, I don't think you understand the value of what you've created. I want to meet you. So he calls me up. I, you know, he's in Little Falls, New Jersey. So I'm like super excited. I'm like, boom. I call my parents like, this is working out. I got this great big meeting. I go in and meet the CEO and I fell in love with his company. He was a nanotechnology company. He had a partnership with Lucent Bell Labs, which was then a renowned lab. And he was reinventing the battery using nanotechnology. Um, and he had a, uh, a, a product that he was, that was an R and D called the nano battery. And I've, we can love it. It was so interesting. And he became a first, one of my first mentors started taking me to the lab. And then he basically offered me in a position with his company to help him with inv- learning about investor relations and public relations while <clears throat> allowing me to build my website working with him. So during that year, it was like unbelievable learning experience. Um, a year goes by and, uh, stocks up. I built it to have the largest shareholder base out of any small cap company, 18,000 shareholders. And I call Ron, I'm like, Ron, we should do the first ever live demonstration of the nano battery. And he's like, brilliant. I want you to do everything from soup to nuts. So I end up inviting all these brokers, inviting the media, inviting the shareholders, all get this venue in New York City and you know, write it up in the press. I was writing his press releases and making his website and videos and all this stuff to promote it. That day comes, we have like over 200 people in the room. Whole goal is that he's gonna put on this demo and raise tens of millions of dollars to take this thing to mass production. It was the first time ever I had to do public speaking and I had dropped out of college. So I never had any experience. So I'm super nervous. I'm in the bathroom with my little cue cards trying to memorize what I'm going to say. Ron comes in, slaps the cards out of my hand, says, look, you got all these guys in the room. Just get out there and be yourself. So I get out there. Hey, everybody. Most of you have talked to me over the phone. I've been behind a lot of the, uh, the press releases and everything. And this is why I believe in them phase. Now, let me introduce you now to the chief executive officer, Ron and the chief scientist officer, Dr. Fred Allen. They come up and um, I'm now sitting there, palm sweaty, they're getting ready to unveil the nano battery, they unveil it, and then basically two screens are showing the battery not using any battery. And what they had created with it was this nano wafer that separated the two liquids in a battery to create essentially an infinite shelf life battery. So that until you turn the device on, it would then shoot a shockwave that would release these pores, allowing the liquids to mix therefore creating energy. All they were trying to do is prove that concept. So they're showing no energy is being used. They hit this button. You know, light bulb's supposed to light. What do you think happens? Yeah, crickets. <laughs> you got it, Ugh. crickets. And it was like the first moment in my life where I was just like all that hard work, everything I was working towards was just like boom, the room erupts, everyone's disappointed, the stock has crashed. Every, and, and I learned so much in that experience, I thought my career was over at that point. But that was like the first moment that I learned about overcoming adversity. So I well f- finish us like I, I've got to know what the rest of uh, you know what happened next in that room at that moment. Is there like a scramble <laughs> by the team to come around this thing and try and figure out what's going wrong, or you know how does that how does that go? Yes. Yeah, so everyone starts raising their hands. What's going on? They have questions. Is it you know? Is this like? you know, a scam, what the hell, you know, everyone's flipping out. And uh, Dr. Fred Allen is up there saying, just hold on. We, we, we think we crossed the leads, for, you know, we're figuring it out. Let's take some questions. And it was just a disaster. They couldn't figure it out. The room is just like getting up, leaving. It was just the biggest disappointment. And I was in the corner with my, my tail between my legs saying to myself, fuck, my career is over. Like, there's no way that I'm, you know, what am I going to do? I just been doing this like all this time, believing this company so much. I couldn't believe that they didn't prepare for this demo. But what happened was interesting. You know, a couple of guys came up to me and they said, hey kid, here's my card. I'm surprised you actually got me to get in this room. Call me. And that's when I went back home and I said to myself, you know what? I can't let this deter me. I gave those some of those people calls and I said, hey look, you know, I was able to get 18,000 shareholders. I ended, my, my passion is marketing. You know, um, I, I, and I started deciding, hey, why don't I create an agency to help small cap companies leverage the, the, what I did learn about, you know, marketing and, and investor awareness. And, you know, I became a fundamentalist understanding like, you know, their income statements, their balance sheets, you know, under, you know, understanding. I, and I started learning about storytelling and how to tell a story. 
and uh, I ended up building that age. I ended up taking that failure and getting one client for, you know, starting off, I think a thousand dollars a month and built that up to six figure clients all the way up until we did about 10 million in revenue at the height by the time I was 24. Mm, wow. So that was your first, your first million dollar business. Correct. Mm, yeah, that's, that's awesome. So 24 years old, you've got that, that business. Where, where did you go from there? This is kind of went like point in my life where I really started to understand ego. I started to under, like understanding a little bit more of myself because early now, now, right. So I dropped out of college. I, I was, I went against the grain, you know, I took the unconventional path. I was proving myself. I learned from this first failure. And all of a sudden I'm this young millionaire, right? I'll never forget the day I called my dad up like dad, you're not going to believe this, but I fucking just made a million dollars. Like I finally worked towards like getting my first million dollars in the bank account. And it was like, you know, I remember him telling me like, well, don't tell nobody. Don't, <laughs> 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 don't tell anyone and, and keep working. And, and he was proud. And, um, but then I started being careless. I started, you know, this young guy with money and I wanted a Bentley and then I wanted a, you know, Ferrari and I wanted to be, and have a penthouse and I wanted to go and rent 150 foot yachts and fly my friends everywhere and travel and do all these things. And I got overly confident. I started trading with the money and made a couple multi-million dollar trades. And then out of nowhere, you know, between 2008 and 2010, you know, I make a trade. I'm up $20 million on this trade, life-changing money. I think I'm on top of the moon. I think I'm Superman. And the market crashes and I lose everything. And I was like, holy shit, here I am thinking I was on top of the world one day and the next, the market just changes my whole entire life. And not just me, but everybody around me. My father gets, you know, after 30 years working for Prudential, you know, he loses his job. My, you know, my friends are all graduating from college and they can't even get, they, their, their diploma is like worthless. They can't even get jobs. They're calling me for work. The whole country is like erupting and my business goes to shit. No one wants to spend money with my agency. That goes to shit. It was just like disaster. That's when I said to myself, you know what? My mom was a huge inspiration to me. My father growing up really instilled leadership in me, but my mom, I also saw work seven days a week to put food on the table. And both my parents worked extremely hard and I owe it all to them because they instilled all the values that I have currently today that made me the entrepreneur I am. My mom, for the first time, told me this story that I never knew at that point in time because I lost everything. She said, son, you know, both my par grandparents immigrated here, you know, to give us opportunity. And she said when, she, when, when her parents came here, she grew up with her, all her brothers and sisters, you know, six brothers, and, you know, six, a family of six in this little one bedroom studio apartment. And one day she's walking home from school and she sees a fire and her friend's like, I, Jenny, I think that fire is your building. My mom couldn't believe it, but that their apartment blew up in flames and everything they had, they lost. And my mom was forced to, with just the shirt on her back, she was the oldest of all her brothers and sisters, have to drop out of high school. And she tells me this story, like, you know, how, what, how it was to actually even get the teacher to a, to allow her to leave school, to get a job, to help the family, like crying to me, telling me like this happened. And she had to drop out of school just so that she can get a job. And, 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 and what she went through to even get a job, having to be courageous enough to go to New York City before she was even 18 to try to get any job possible in the middle of the winter, just so she can make a little bit of money to help the family. And with the shirt off her back, with the shirt, just with the shirt on her back, she did all of that to help rebuild the family and now build this wonderful family with me and my two sisters. And she was like, and if I was able to do that, then you best believe you better, better get back out there and you can do anything out there in life. If you believe in yourself, you could do it again. And I said, whoa. So that was like the biggest kick in the butt I needed. And um, I said, all right, if I did it once, I could do it again. And that's when it led me to more of the startup world. I, uh, at first, um, what I did was before I you, uh, Jared, before you dive into that, I, I want to ask real quick, you know, after, uh, cause I've gone through something very similar to that. I had a, a $10 million business that had $10 million, 10 million in revenue in its first year. And then, uh, you know, bad stuff happens a couple of years later and it poof, it's all gone. Yeah. What yeah. was the lesson that you took away from that? Not to take anything for granted for sure. It was definitely for me, I feel somewhat that, you know, at that point in time in my life, I was taking things for granted. And at, at any point in time, like anything can, ch anything can change, anything can happen. You know, it's just like, don't take things for granted and do, you know, it was like, when you have success, it's not about the money. It's about what you do with that success and how you really impact those around you and make, you know, and, and that's kind of what I really learned um, from that. And did you have, 
did you have uh you know for lack of a better word a, a mantra or you know what i what i think is unbelievably important is what you tell yourself in times of uh challenge and it's the you know it's the words it's the phrases you're repeating in your head it's the thoughts that you have that are going to determine what happens you know right, in a situation right. like that is there something specific that you used to focus on and just tell yourself over and over again yeah i i basically would just say to myself and it was like, you know, you're right. It's like all about mindset. So I would just basically say like, Gerard, this is adversity at its finest. You cannot give up. I can be successful again. I can do it again. And it's about, you know, it was about me. So I would just, you know, I had kept telling myself like, you can get through this. Don't give up. Bounce back from this. Like you, you know, you can be, continue to be successful. And you have to believe. And this is just adversity and fight through, you know, and even to this day, like it just, it's made me stronger. Uh, that failure because, you know, I, 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 no matter what I know, like just keep going, like just keep moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agreed. You know, what I think about most whenever I'm up against a challenge that, that is causing me, uh, some pause, uh, is frankly, it's, it's Elon and, and SpaceX where it's like, here's a guy who's on a public stage in front of the world, the entire planet is watching, and the first three rockets he sends up blow up in the middle, of, you know, of space. They don't even reach it, right? So, like failing on a spectacular public forum, but so what? Like we'll build another one, blows up. All right, we'll build another one, blows up, right? Until he eventually gets it. And um, I'm like, man, my problems are nothing <laughs> compared to that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, you were about to you were about to dive into the next chapter, uh, that yeah. that came after that. So how did that go? I started really. This is when like my passion for content really started to grow. Mm -hmm. um, prior to Elite Daily, I uh, I started looking at the economy, of course, right, because it affected all of us so much. And I started looking at my generation. I'm saying, damn, you know, like everything that's going on with the with the economy, no one's really paying. And it, our generation is not really paying to, pay attention to like the true economics of our country, our debt crisis, right? Um, our student loan debt crisis as well, and like our deficit and all these things that I was studying because I was involved with understanding and following, you know, the stock market and the economy and things. So, I, and everyone, I'm like, everyone's paying attention to the Jersey Shore right now, or the Kim, Car you know, or the Kardashians. I'm like, what, what? Who's educating us, like our generation, about the economy? So I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to start playing my role. I started a company called Inflation. The website's Inflation.us. All educating about the economy. It's still around today. And I started making documentaries, made about four uh, acclaimed documentaries, getting millions of views, ended up getting on like, you know, some Bloomberg, Fox Business, things like that. And we're all around the economy. And the last one was called College Conspiracy. And it was all about exposing the student loan debt crisis. Uh, because that was something that like I noticed all my friends are graduating from college. They all had all this debt that was continuing to compound. The government wasn't helping them. And they had this degree where they couldn't get jobs. And, you know, you know, I wanted to to expose the student loan debt crisis, you know, that there should be somewhat of a free market to get schools to at a time of where we're seeing a recession. Still, the two things that are going through the roof with inflation are our education and health care. How is that possible? You know what I mean? The things we need most. So I wanted to expose that. So that got millions and millions of views. I got really passionate about making video and making content and and then that, I started investing into different entrepreneurs and mentoring entrepreneurs. And then that's when I met a young guy who, and I don't know if you, if you want me to go on to the next, next chapter or not, but, uh, that's, that was when elite daily that the next chapter where elite was, was starting to come together. So that's, you know, that's been, uh, your biggest, your biggest win so far. But for those who are not familiar with elite daily or, you know, even what it is or what it's about, take us through, through that. Sure. I'm probably one of the is definitely the most unbelievable journey for me as a uh, entrepreneur out of all the, you know, forget about it, all the you know, dozens of companies that I tried starting and failed along the way. But uh, that was the best journey, you know, to know that we hit 80 million unique people per month coming to our website to get news for Generation Y and being the fast, the, the fastest growing millennial publication in the world, like in just three years was like, you know, and seeing how we built this team was just like unbelievable. So take so take me through the business model of a of a content website because you know I look at that and I see one of the most difficult businesses that I can think of to start. Where it's uh, you, if you can, I imagine just an ocean of content out there, and 
noise and static and here you've got a site and even if you've got good content it's like a drop in the ocean almost a commodity basically at this point so how does that work you know i I agree with you um i think if i were to start elite daily again today would nowhere near be as successful as it was when we started it i think that's why timing is so important as an entrepreneur Um, and i think we definitely timed it right because when we did start it back in 2011 there was obviously still a huge publication landscape but for millennials, there wasn't this one-stop shop. There was very niche-based publications, right? Like if you just want to learn about fashion or if you want to learn about gossip and entertainment or you want to learn about college bros and, you know, there was like these little individual sites that were like, you know, their expertise was one single category. There wasn't like this like Huffington Post for Generation Y. We saw that because it was something we were looking for, right? We, were, we are the demographic and we said to ourselves – and these other big publications that are mass market didn't speak to us. They didn't speak our language. They didn't, uh, you know, they weren't they written for us by us. And we were like, well, we need to fill this gap. And we just attacked. And we didn't have the business model laid out. We didn't have the business plan. We just knew that there was something. There was this. There was the, there, It was missing in the marketplace. And we we're just like, let's just attack. Let's just do it. Let's go for it now. And the process became the plan. And at that time, you know, I was mentoring my, my CEO was, was my intern. Uh, he was only 18 at the time. He reminded me of a young me, David, and he brought his buddy from college, Jonathan St. Pedro, was one of the hardest working young guys I've ever met. And we just attacked us three. We went for it. And we noticed very quickly that this was needed, that, that we were, that we were quickly uh, engaging with an audience of the millennial generation and that it was something that they wanted. And we quickly realized this formula of how, man, how can we scale this, right? Because there's only so many articles I can write. There's only so many articles you can write. There's only so many articles our buddies can write. Like, how are we going to scale this? What we did was we figured out how to master opening up this contributing network and getting ambassadors from every university in the nation to recruit for us writers to have – but we we created this this culture of like this is a family like we daily let it be your voice let it be your vessel it's not just a news platform this is like a, a, a the voice of our generation so we're gonna no we're not gonna have no filter we're not gonna be politically correct you're gonna tell it raw well you how you feel about whatever it is whether it's you know dating or health or business or you know a- anything in categories like you can be authentic with us elite daily is where you're gonna get it raw and uncut. And we knew that that's what would 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 engage with our millennial generation. They were they were they were seeking, you know, that kind of authenticity, and 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 and, and that's what we did. You know, we ended up opening up that contributing network. We open, we were able to scale it to two thousand contributors to help us get about eighty to one hundred articles per day, and leveraging social media, the power of social media. That we think that um, a lot of other publications at that point in time were still they were doing a good job at it, but we mastered it. We were we really knew how to get content that was going to scale and get share be shareable quickly fast um through the, through the millennial demographic and then starting to analyze like what were the key words what were the key things that were were going more viral than others and then there was just you know hard work you know everybody part of the team was like we created a really important culture that kept people wanting to stay and work stay with our company work hard stay late want to be there but yet still and be still be challenged still have freedom still being still learning, still having fun. And because of that culture, we were able to have an amazing team that we owe it all to, over 200 employees when we were, when we got bought by Daily Mail. Um, and uh, it's been amazing. Wow, man. So two, 200 employees. So what are the biggest questions I ask on, or at least recently, most of my episodes? And my audience uh, is either getting tired of me asking this question or they're loving it. But <laughs> until I figure this out, I'm going to keep asking because this is such an important thing. I've uh, I've done very well at at growing uh, companies on my own and and getting you know the most we've had is about twelve employees, and that's not been my skill set. But at the same time, and, you know, other than maybe one or two books out there, they're not like these instruction manuals on how to scale a business. So I'm always asking guests like yourself who've gone up and scaled to that level is what did that process look like for you? Because at this point, even with all of the research and all of the interviews that I've done on this, there isn't a tried and true process and everybody has a little bit of a different story. So, you know, are you posting job, you know, listings on Monster or did you hire an executive team? How much experience did they have? Like, what did that process look like? (laughs) I gotta be really honest with you though. It, it, It was 
it, I, I guess, you know, what we really learned also through this process was not no, almost not so much the hiring, but what's more important is the firing. And I know it's kind of like rough for people to get and understand, but it's really about, you know, the hiring process for us is like, do you vibe with us? It wasn't so much like, you know, yeah, we want to know, like, are you a writer? Are you more passionate? Are you, you know, you know, part of tech? Are you, uh, you know, human resources? And we, we will nail, we nailed that down. But then it was more for us about like, you know, your character, right? Like how you would fit into the culture. Are you fun? Are you going to be like, are you a good people's person? Are you a good communicator? You know, like just certain things that we know that you would like fit into our culture and, and know that this was like a very family environment. You're like, are you a giver? Are you willing to like be someone who's going to get along with, with, you know, get along with the team and, and, um, and, and like, I think the work ethic part was really important to us. Like, are you willing to make the commitment that this is not going to just be your typical nine to five? Like you're going to have to sometimes be really committed and dedicated because we're, we're the underdog here for our generation, right? We didn't raise tens of millions of dollars. We're going up against Buzzfeeds of the world. You know, we are going to need you to be really committed because we're the underdog and we're out there with a mission for our generation to have something like this that can, that can compete. You know, it's our time to have a publication out there that speaks to us. And that, that was important. And we had someone that was really committed. Um, so that was like the hiring process, but the hard part for us was the firing process. It was like when we figured out that somebody didn't fit into the culture, didn't have that work ethic, you know, didn't t- wasn't able to learn from their mistakes or take constructive criticism or, you know, it, whatever. It just was somewhat of a cancer in, in in the company. Like we we had to quickly be willing to say we're sorry, but it's not working. And 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 that there was a that was something that we learned more than anything. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I know I've uh, I know I've had uh, struggles with that specifically in my early years uh, as a business owner. But uh, I've found, at least personally, it really never gets easier. That's a that's a tough piece about leadership. So you would go on eventually to to sell Elite Daily for around fifty million and walk walk us through that story. Is is that a an offer that just showed up one day? That or were you out there seeking to sell the business? What did that look like? And, and, you know, having gone through that, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs who have an opportunity to sell their company, like pitfalls to look out for, landmines, things like that? So I think you shouldn't build a company right from the get with an exit strategy. Like, oh, I'm going to just sell this company in a year and I'm building it. Like, I kind of don't like it when I have entrepreneurs come to me with that idea. You know, for us, it was more of like we wanted to build the biggest, baddest, like millennial global media company in the world. That's that we were, that's what we were set out to do. But we were strategic. It's extremely important to be strategic, um, to bring on partnerships and bring on advisors and bring, build your board and bring on the right strategic investors that will position you for that growth and potentially put, put, put you in a position for a potential uh, merger or acquisition that will help you get to that next level. And that's how we thought about it. And we saw, we did seek out John Steinberg. You know, he, I, I first saw him at an event, Morgan Stanley speaking event. He spoke there. I just learned that he had left BuzzFeed and he was getting ready to make a transition to a new big media publication. I said to myself, whoa, we got to get this guy as an advisor. I mean, who better to kind of, you know, give us, um, you know, get meant, you know, give us some advice and, 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 and direct us than a guy who's been a part of like a peer we looked up to Buzzfeed and, you know, a big competitor of ours as well. And, you know, so we saw, we, we figured out how can we come up with a unique way to creative way to get in touch with him and to get him interested. And we did that, um, through strategic, our, our investors helped us. And, uh, once we got him on as an advisor, you know, yeah, we said to ourselves, not only will this guy have an amazing knowledge to share with us, but this could be potential, you know, M and A down the road. We did never thought within like three months that he would have been meeting our CEO, my, my my partner David and saying, looking into all of our analytics, seeing our culture, seeing how special it was, and saying, okay, boom, an offer comes through. Um, it was exciting. We were like, oh my god, this is like a dream for us. But we were also like kind of under the gun because at that same point in time we needed to raise money. We were scaling so fast that our, and and working in New York City, our burn was so high. And with that scaling that we were running out of leeway, we were running out of runway. So it was like, we had to raise capital and raise capital fast. So we were at the same time, flying to Silicon Valley, meeting investors in New York, meeting our investors, trying to raise money. And they were kind of working around trying to get the best valuation, the valuation that we didn't like. And it was everything in my life stopped. It was like, all in, we got to figure this out, you know, and I helped the company get another option of raising 5 million. I got a couple investors that believed in us and 
put a, we're, we're willing to give it five million to us. So we got another option, but Daily Mail gave us very strict time frame to make a decision. Uh, it was going into the end of the year. And at first, I'll be honest with you, I was against it. I was like, you know what? I think the offer's too low. They're basing a lot of it off of uh, monetization. Our users, we spent all these years first focusing on our users and focusing on building a brand and, and having brand equity with the millennial generation. And we're just now really, you know, building our own internal sales team. At first, we kind of were outsourcing through an agency to monetize. And so our numbers were, yeah, our numbers were great, but they were like nowhere near, we were just scratching the surface. So I was like, if we hold off another year or two, we can get, you know, maybe triple what they're offering. So I was like pretty much a little against it, but all of our advisors were like, no, this is a, this is a solid deal that I hope you get to the next level. It's a great partnership. And then the biggest thing happened was I was finally in a final, our final board meeting and you know, biggest, biggest meeting of my life. Alan Patrickoff himself, the godfather VC is in this room and everybody's ready to, you know, make this decision. And I, I was still iffy about it because we had on the phone, the investors that were willing to put in the 5 million. And I finally looked at my partners, David and Jonathan. I said, guys, let's go in the other room. Us three, right? We're the co-founders. We pulled us three go in the other room. We look each other in the eyes. And I'm like, guys, this is it. This is the biggest decision of our life. You know, do we take it or, or take the money, do we keep the, the 5 million or take this, take this exit. And, you know, what David said to me made a lot of sense, and I was like, we started this thing together, and we're going to finish it. And he basically said to me, Gerard, you know what? There's a risk. Facebook is changing their algorithms. We're starting to see them play with the algorithms. We think that's going to affect our business. There's a risk that if they do what we think they're going to do, it can really hurt our traffic. Who knows what that'll look like? And this is a great deal, all cash. This changes our lives. You know, it gives us the, it gives Elite Daily, it's bigger than us to live on forever, be part of our legacy and continue to do other things. And we think that this gives all, and it also gives security to everybody who believed in us. All those employees that believe in us that were in there been grinding day in and day out, like it gave them security. And we were like, you know what? We started this together. We're going to finish it together. We went back in that room. We cried. We voted. We hugged. We celebrated. And that day changed all of our lives. Mm, that's awesome, man. That is super cool. So I've got a couple of questions based on that. Uh, you know, one, you're you're out there looking, um, you know, looking for additional funding to scale. You're growing like crazy. Were you guys making a profit at that point? We were cash flow positive. Yes. Okay. All right. But, just but, but just the additional. Go ahead. No, I was going to say you just you were looking for the additional capital to to just add add strength to your position or. So we were. At that same time, like we were barely breaking cash flow positive at that point in time. And, and we were also needing to add, we were like still scaling at that point in time. So like we, we, we needed to add to like our tech team. We needed to add to um, like bring in data scientists to help us out. It was like we were, part of our plan was bringing on board and we had made commitments. Like we knew, we know, we knew we needed more leadership as well. And we made commitments to a lot of like great, big leaders to come on board to help us continue to build this company out and uh, we in order for us to to satisfy those commitments that we made we knew we had to raise money quickly got it and then on the advisor side if you could give people an idea of how you guys typically compensated your advisors cuz it's such an important piece uh to have on your chessboard but you know I haven't come across any hard and fast, you know, set of rules for, Hey, here's typically how advisors are compensated. Yeah. First and foremost, if you're out there and you have a startup, um, I'm telling you right now, your advisory board is extremely important and was a key component to us getting our acquisition and our growth. Um, so definitely get great advisors and, you know, um, for typically, you know, it, depending on the company, um, it's usually a quarter of a percent all the way up to like a percent, you know, what's typical is like half of a, per, of a percent, um, is very typical. Got it. That's great to know. That's a great reference point, man. Awesome story. So you guys have exited the company and it sounds like you gave all of your employees stock options as well. We did. Oh my God. I got such a great story. <laughs> so real quick. So yes, we did. We gave stock options. Some of the, obviously our key day ones and, uh, I get a speaking engagement, you know, I've sold the company now and could get a speaking engagement in Thailand. I was so excited. So I'm like, yes, I've always wanted to go to Thailand. It's in front of like the biggest crowd, like 2000 people. I go out there, uh, and I get a freaking Facebook message from my CTO, Adrian Gorris, who is like 
the baddest CTO out there. And he's like, he's like such a big part of our success. And he's like, hey, dude, I've been traveling the world, <laughs> you know, hitting all these different places. And he's like, I'm right in by Bangkok. Like, let's meet up. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. What are the chances that we're both in Bangkok at the same time? You know, hmm. so we meet up and he ends up joining me on this trip. We end up going to the Fifi Islands, Maya Bay. Like, have you ever seen the movie The Beach with Leonardo DiCaprio? And here we are, like, you know, month, like, uh, you know, whatever it was, a, a few months later, and never would have expected to just bump into my CTO. It was like a day one with us, you know, in, you know, now in the middle of the island, in the middle of Thailand, jumping off a boat, celebrating together. And uh, it was it was great for me to see someone who believed in us, who was an early on employee, be able to now live, do something that was it was important to him and now be able to like kind of like travel the world, take some time off and just, uh, you know, and then and somehow we meet meet up on the other side of the planet um, and get to jump in the water together off that boat. It was, that was a, that was big. That was awesome. That's cool. That's super cool. So, you know, you're at this point uh, in your career where you don't have any more responsibilities from, you know, day to day business. You've got money in the bank. What are you thinking? Shoof, man, I'll never forget, like, you know, calling home, being like, deals done, unbelievable, calling my, my best friends from kindergarten back from home. And they were like, man, dude, like crazy, because I still was a little bittersweet at first because I was like, I, you still don't know, like, man, did I just give away my baby? Like, could, was it going to, were we on track to be a billion dollar company? You just don't really know, right? Are these algorithms going to change? Looking back at it, it was the right decision. Those algorithms did change and it did put our track. But at that moment, but then it was my best friend and family saying, Gerard, you always want to jump out of a plane without a parachute and see if you can land or fly. Like, you know, this is a huge. So um, it was at that point in time that I was able to, like, take care, do some things that I've always wanted to do, like, you know, pay off my parents' mortgage and, you know, surprise my dad with a Mercedes on Father's Day and, and, and help take care of my sisters and just do certain things that I've always wanted to do. And then that's when I started looking at the millennial thought leadership landscape and saying, okay, how can I now take these 13 years of ups and downs and really uh, be someone that can, that, can, uh, that can mentor and inspire this next generation to, for them to take this, to take this a path to, to make an impact and, and be the next generation of leaders. And, and so that has led you to what over the last – last couple of years now, because I know we, we talked a little bit about your passion around the education system, around leadership these days. You've got an awesome show that you're producing on YouTube. Dive into all of that for us. So it started with uh, going to a Tony Robbins event and then seeing this the, the, him impact all these people. And his quote stuck with me. It was, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Which, uh, which event did you go to? I went to uh, UPW, Unleash the Power Within. Okay, cool. I went to, to Date with Destiny two years ago. Oh, I haven't gotten to that one yet. I'm actually really excited because I actually am seeing Tony tomorrow. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm so excited. He's got a movie coming out right now, so we're going to the screening. And uh, so success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. It was ingrained in me. And uh, I still did, a pa I did the YouTube as a passion project, a, a series called Leaders Create Leaders on Gerard Adams TV on YouTube. Um, but what I did was I've been working on, we just opened it up two months ago. We built a building in North New Jersey. That's where my family um, was from. My church is, is there. I've been going there my whole life. Brick City you know, is what kind of like made me tough and how I got my namesake as well. And I built an incubator right in the heart of Newark. 48 Norfolk Street to teach entrepreneurship and leadership um, and bring resources in the environment, which I've learned from being in New York City or in Silicon Valley that I still, that I said to myself, yeah, I can go and do this in big cities, but why not take the, what we've seen this ecosystem help build a community in somewhere like, you know, uh, like Silicon Valley and bring that to community, urban communities and inner cities to teach them things that they don't learn in school, personal development, financial literacy, entrepreneurship, leadership, and see how through that type of education, through an incubator, through you know this type of development, how much it can truly make an impact in these type of communities. So I launched Founders. It's F-O-W-N-D-E-R-S. You can go to founders.com, the word own in the middle to teach ownership, own your life, own your destiny, um, own your future. And uh, it's been the most fulfilling work I've ever done in my entire life. That's awesome. What is that? What does that look like on a on a day to day basis? Like, what's what's taking place in the community and and the incubator? The goal is to have it make that impact in North, but then take it nationwide in urban communities around the country. But you know, on a day to day basis, one, I have a bunch of amazing apprentices and young aspiring entrepreneurs, and we're 
we're building companies. I'm helping, helping them learn about from seed to scale, how to start a company, everything from like how to, the difference between an LLC and incorporating a company to, you know, writing a business plan and uh, understanding investor tech and, and just doing, learning from actually like building and doing and and i talk about like failing forward learning learning from our all of our mistakes and how important it is for us to work together and empower one another and then we're also building relationships with a lot of the different stakeholders in the community and different organizations like my brother's keeper and and working in with and giving internships and mentorship to some of the local the local students in newark and and uh it's like it's been unbelievable because i've where we are, we get a lot of foot traffic from all the different schools. And I, one individual in particularly was changed my life. It was his name, Shaquille, um, you know, my Shaq. And one day he passed by the incubator and I was out outside on a call and he said, Hey man, what is this? And I said, well, it's an incubator for entrepreneurs. And you know, and what's that? And I said, well, why don't you come inside and, you know, check it out. It's, you know, and he came inside and I was finishing my call and he comes back outside after like 20 seconds. He's like, Hey man, this isn't for me. I don't belong here. And I was like, what do you mean you don't belong here? If you go through life saying that you don't belong anywhere, you're not going to get anywhere in life. You belong where you feel you belong, and you can't have that kind of mentality. So let's get back inside. Let it marinate. Let's talk a little bit. And once I got to know Shaq, I had some one-on-one mentorship with him and learning about his life and why he's, he felt that way, where everyone's always lied to him his whole life. He didn't grow up with a father. He had no role models. He felt in, get entrapped in the system in his environment. He's, he saw his, his uncle get murdered on his front foot, uh, you know, right in front of his house. And he's been to, his best friend got killed and, you know, the dr- drugs and violence in the area and things that like, up, up, now there's amazing initiatives that are happening in Newark, but you know, it wasn't, you know, a year ago, like nine, oh, up to 80, 90% of the students didn't even have Wi-Fi at home. And um, once I dove into him and told him a lot about my early beginnings on how I could have went down the wrong path, you know, being around, being around drugs and gangs and violence and things and, t- and, and, and going in a different path and learning how I, to be a leader and put myself in the right environments and take risk and be brave and look for mentorship and things. And once I talk to him and, and now he's become one of my strongest apprentices, he comes in every day, he's committed. And I've seen him literally from that moment I met him thinking he doesn't belong anywhere to being one of the, the strongest leaders in the, in the incubator, um, but a completely different mindset. And uh, he's one of our biggest advocates now in the community, in the hood, like getting, getting people behind us. And uh, it's, been, it's been amazing. That's awesome, man. Very cool. So what's your what's your vision for founders? Do you want to take this to other cities? What are you what are your plans? Yep. So, um, you know, we're we are building businesses. So, you know, it's fun. You know, we're, we're incubating, we're rapid prototyping, we're launching businesses, we're want to see that make an impact in the community where not only will we educate our youth, we're building a program to also teach skills like coding, graphic design, video editing, art, like all types of different personal development to also the to the youth there, and uh, so we're building out that program and and then you know proving this concept that it again can you know we're doing things in the community, throwing events in the community, doing workshops, you know, building this youth program, building companies, and then you know my goal is after I can prove this concept, just like any business, right, in a year look back and see how to change this area and how it's changed these you know some of the youth there, um, empowered them, seen some of the businesses become successful and launch. Um, real estate, we're building another 21 apartment building across the street. I want to build like a boxing gym and, or I'm thinking maybe jujitsu. Um, we're all launching little restaurants in the area, but showing how it's going to change and create this founder's district, then franchise it. And I want to go and speak around the nation, calling all leaders, partner up with leaders in their communities and help them take our process and our platform. I'm building out an online education platform around founders and just take all of this and package it up and bring it into these uh, urban inner cities and communities around the nation. That's awesome. That is a super cool vision. Uh, just some of the things you you mentioned a second ago about the restaurants and and the apartments and stuff. Have you had a chance to go uh, hang out with Tony uh, Shea down in, in Vegas and seeing what he's been building? So I've had... I, I, I look up to Tony Shea so much. Um, I, this is what this is. I'm hoping this podcast will help me with that. You know, I mean, 
I've yet to really tell, I've been too busy working, right? Building this out in Newark and it's been, you know, I'm in totally present and tuned in and making and, and being in tune. So, so that my work speaks for itself, but Hey, oh, Tony Shea, if you're listening, I'm coming, I want to meet you and I want to learn from you and, and I want to make an impact with you and anybody else out there. That's a leader. I want us to all come together and work together. Um, and that's how we'll all unite and, and really uh, make a difference in this world. And, uh, I look forward to, uh, hopefully meeting you. Awesome. Well, guys, let's uh, let's help make that connection. If you can hit up Tony on Twitter or Facebook or email, if you have it, send him this podcast, and uh, and I will do my best to get you guys introduced as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very cool. So that's an amazing, amazing mission, amazing goal, and man, this has just been an awesome story. What would we've got about you know five minutes left here, so. What would you like to share with everybody who's listening today, you know, knowing that the vast majority of people who are listening to this are entrepreneurs that are looking to become a business owner, uh, you know, last kind of words of wisdom that you'd like to, to share with them? I think we live in a world right now where we're all seeing a really a lot of problems, right? There's a lot of talk with racism. There's a lot of talk with violence. There's a lot of terrorism happening. There's a lot of pain and struggle. Um, we all have gone through it, you know, the economy you know, with, you know, even, even, you know, with, with, uh, you know, politics right now. I mean, it's just, there's a lot that's going on if you pay attention to the media. And I think we need leaders more than ever before. We all need to step up and being a leader isn't about being a big CEO or being a billion, you know, having a billion dollar company or selling your company for 50 million. Like, you know, it's, it, that's, it has nothing to do with, with that. And it's not even about a title. It's about each and every one of us stepping up right now, being, finding the leader within, you know, being a role model, being brave, being resilient, being persistent, you know, making an impact on those around you, even if it's just a high five when you see somebody walking down the street. And I think we all need to come together. We all need to be leaders. And uh, that will help solve the world's biggest problem. So uh, that's the message that I want to leave. Awesome, brother. Well, where can people connect with you? Uh, you know, you've got the, the season finale of your show coming out, the, the video production I love. We were, we were mentioning we've had a, a bunch of guests on there who are, are mutual friends of ours like Clay, Craig Clemens. Tell us where people can go connect with you and, and founders, obviously. Sweet. So uh, I would, uh, for, the, for the finale, uh, if you go to youtube.com slash Gerard Adams TV, you'll see the finale there. Founders, we are at f o w n d e r s dot com. Founders with the word own in the middle dot com. You can find me. Um, I'm very in tune with social media. So Gerard Adams on Instagram. That's what I use probably the most. And Snapchat is uh, is 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 probably is, uh, maybe even before Instagram with hello Gerard. Twitter, I am Gerard Adams, and you can email me at Gerard at founders dot com. Awesome. Well, this has been one of my all-time favorite podcasts, Gerard. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It's uh, it's unbelievably inspiring, and I learned a ton on on uh, on this episode. So, thank you so much for your time today, guys. Go connect with Gerard, check him out, and uh, let's put him in touch with Tony. So, yeah. so uh, do your best as far as that goes, and and we'll make that happen. So, thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 